Our first speaker is one of your fearless leaders of this data community, DC. When I say fearless, he is fearless in many ways. Uh, you got him about his past profession, uh, when he had to actually go and actually literally risk his life. Or you could talk to him about his love of ironing boards and his crazy expensive ironing boards. Today is a very special day. It is our speaker's 40th birthday. So he is here celebrating with us at the R conference. Everyone, please welcome to the stage, Tommy. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tommy Jones, as Jared said. Um, and I actually believe I've had the honor to speak at the DCR slash RGov conference every year that, that Jared's held it. Um, in real life, I wear quite a few hats. I spend my days running back and forth between the statistics, machine learning, and business communities. Uh, I work on the technical staff in an investment firm called InQtel, where I help source investments in machine learning startups. Uh, as Jared said, I'm the vice president of Data Community DC, which is a nonprofit dedicated to building a community of practice for data scientists in the DC area. Uh, and I'm also a PhD candidate at George Mason University's Department of Computational and Data Sciences. And so that's sort of relevant today, that last one. So I'm studying latent gear clay allocation to help develop more statistically principled ways to analyze language. And because language is an abundant and information rich data source, in fact, it's so information rich, it's literally the protocol that we use to convey information to each other. I dream of a world where we can measure ideas and culture through language with the same level of scientific rigor that we use to measure the economy like unemployment uh, or prices or the effect of a medical intervention, like the effect size of giving a, a medication to a treated group. And to do that, we need two things. Uh, we need a lot more science. Um, and my dissertation is a drop in that bucket, trying to develop some statistical theory for working with LDA models. And we also need tools that are intu intuitive and user-friendly. And this is why I love the tidyverse so much. So drilling a little deeper into that, the current generation of language models works so well, uh, and LDA is now about almost 20 years old. Uh, so why am I still studying it? There's a couple limitations to the current batch of language models. Um, first, they're inherently task-based. In fact, they op uh, operate on something called the Common Task Framework. So they're built for doing discrete things like building chatbots, document summarizers, part of speech taggers. Um, but they aren't really fit for making inferences on populations from samples, this, uh, samples, this inherently statistical principle. Second, uh, they're almost all deep neural networks. Uh, for all the predictive power they bring, they're basically black boxes when it comes to interpretability. And I would like to see text analyses enter the statistical mainstream and focus on what statisticians do best, this uh, getting inferences on populations from samples not just building better chatbots, although building better chatbots is important. Um, I've taken to call in this corpus statistics to differentiate it from this common task framework-based natural language processing. And so with the goals of corpus statistics in mind, LDA has some nice properties. It aids in interpretability and uncertainty quantification by embedding text into a probability space. In fact, when you look under the hood, this is sort of how we do all of statistics. Uh, we can lean on statistical best practices when we're using it, since it's a Bayesian parametric model, and we can study it as a data generating process to help provide sanity checks when uh, we're building models uh, in the real world. And on the tool side of things, uh, in recent years, R has come a long way in developing intuitive frameworks for working with data. And tidy text and a handful of other packages highlighted in red on the left side here do this for text data. And now back in 2015, when I released TextMiner, the text analysis ecosystem in R was not at all easy to work with. Uh, but since then, I've fallen in love with the Tidyverse and the growing ecosystem of Tidy text mining tools. And so in that vein, uh, I'd like to introduce Tidy LDA. It's a package for latent, building latent deer clay allocation models using Tidy principles. Uh, and as we'll see later on, it has some unique capabilities for transfer learning that are based off of uh, my dissertation research. So for a quick review, um, here's an intuitive take on LDA. Uh, it takes a collection of documents there on the left that are full of words and splits them into two groups. Topics, which are now collections of related words and simplified documents, which are collections of topics. Uh, and these are represented by our variables of interest, beta and theta respectively. 
Um, here is a more technical take. I'm not going to get too much into this, um, but you sort of you can't have an LDA talk without the plate diagrams. Um, so you, in addition to beta and theta, the parameters of interest, um, because this is a Bayesian model, you need uh, these prior parameters for tuning uh, alpha and eta, and then they all work together in the model that's that's drawn by this diagram. Uh, but as I said, I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, but I will quickly turn to uh, a demo. And so, Jared, please pipe up if you don't see my uh, RStudio instance. So I'm going to demo some basic functionality here uh, of Tidy LDA. First, I'll just load some libraries. Uh, we're going to pull data out of the Project Gutenberg. So let's download uh, the War of the Worlds here. Take a moment. And if we look here uh, down at the bottom, um, We've got a tibble with three columns. The middle column is really the most important one, uh, which is one line, uh, one row per line in uh, the, uh, the book. And so I'm going to throw some regular expressions at this uh, to try and get two columns that uh, calculate the uh, which paragraph uh, words belong in and delete extra blank lines, uh, as well as uh, which chapter. And so we can use paragraph and chapter to group uh, some of these together for modeling. Then we're going to create this uh, tidy tibble um, using the unnest token functions from tidy text. And so now it's one row in this tibble is one word or token. Uh, and we still have the paragraph and chapter uh, indices there to work with. And then, of course, you know, uh, I'm not going to do much with it, but uh, before you do any modeling, you should start summarizing your data. And so this is counting uh, the word frequency by chapter. So uh, latent deer clay allocation is a statistical model. So the first thing we need to do with it is to get a data matrix. So we're going to, this function will create what's called a document term matrix. Uh, it's just declaring the function there. A document term matrix has one row per document, one column per word or token. Um, and we're going to build a document term matrix on the first half of the chapters uh, in this book. And so we'll do that. Um, and I printed the dimensionality here. So even though this document term matrix is, oh, let me get my environment up here, uh, is this weird DGC matrix up there, uh, it still has dimensionality. So 388 paragraphs, 3,285 words there. And so now we can get to modeling. Um, we use the tidy LDA function here, and you just pass it your data, uh, which is this document term matrix. It doesn't have to be this one. It works with several different uh, commonly used formats for document term matrices. I chose 27 topics. That's just one per uh, chapter here, uh, and a few other arguments that we'll hand to the Gibbs sampler. If I run that, you can see we have this nice progress bar on the bottom. If I print this out to the console, it gives us some useful information. So we have an LDA model uh, with 27 topics, 388 documents, 3,285 tokens. So that's the same dimensionality as the data matrix we handed to it. You get the call here. So for some reproducibility, if you can hand it a model, you can at least see what arguments were passed to this. Um, R squared, which is a, a metric, it, it is R squared. I derived it. This is some other research, but it's the proportion of variability in the data explained by the model. So you can interpret it very similarly to the, the R squared and linear regression. You get your top five most prevalent topics. So these are ones where they have the most words associated with them across the corpus. Topic index here, uh, the prevalence score, this is the percentage of tokens that are associated with that. Coherence, I'll talk about that in a minute, and your, your top five words in that topic. You also get the five most coherent topics. So coherence is a metric that's designed to mimic human interpretability. The coherence metric used in tidy LDA basically looks for uh, words in a topic that are correlated with each other in a statistically dependent way. Um, and so these are those most coherent topics. And if you want to get that information for all your topics, you can look at this uh, model summary object in, in your model. And that gives the same information for all 27 topics there. 
So as I said before, uh, one of your variables of interest is beta, and we have a, a tidier to, to pull out a tidy tibble for beta. And so now this is, you've got uh, this three column tibble, your topic index, your token, and the probability of that token in that topic. Um, we can use that to create nice little plots. This will take a moment to render. Uh, I pulled this from Julia Silge's uh, vignette on tidy topic modeling. So no original work here. It takes a moment to render. We get these nice bar plots. Um, and you can see that all the topics are uh, decreasing in terms of their top 10 most probable words. Uh, if I want to look at, say, topic 21, which is the most prevalent topic here, uh, or topic 10, which is my most coherent topic there, um, you get that plot. So we also have a tidier to pull out uh, theta, which is our other variable of interest. That's the um, probability of the topic within each document or each paragraph. So you got the uh, paragraph number, topic number, uh, and the probability of that topic within that paragraph. Uh, we could make similar plots to uh, this one, but uh, I'm going to leverage the fact that we know that this is these paragraphs came from a book. They were all in sequential order, so you can get this nice little time series plot. And what was it? Topic 10 was our most coherent one. So let's look at that. And you can see that there's sort of a, a burst here uh, in the first half uh, or right around the halfway mark, or I guess that would be about a quarter way mark through the book uh, where that topic's really prevalent. So we only build a model on the first half of the book, but we can build a document term matrix on the second half of the book and predict topic distributions under the model. And so here, looking at the dimensionality of this new matrix, we have 508 paragraphs and now 5,017 unique tokens. So that tells me that um, the second half of chapters actually has more words and is longer than the first half. Um, and we can do the call this predict function. It works just like predict functions in the rest of our hand it your model object, your new data, and uh, some additional arguments you need to hand to the Gibbs sampler. Um, I get the little progress bar again, and it creates uh, here, if you can see my mouse on the right, just a matrix, 508 rows, 27 columns. Um, and we can tidy that up using the tidier for theta here. Um, and so this looks just like what we pulled out of the model, but uh, with new documents, uh, the probability of each topic within that document. And under the model, I can uh, see how frequent that topic 10 is in the second half of the book. And we see it has a bit more of an even distribution. And so right here, um, I'm going to uh, just run this really quickly for time, but uh, we can do a bar plot that compares um, the topic prevalences uh, in the first half of the book versus the second. So in orange, we've got the distribution of topics uh, in the first half of the book, and blue is a distribution in the second half. Um, they're pretty equal, but there are some topics that are more prevalent in uh, the first half and the second. But because they came from the same model and it's the same book, maybe it's not too uh, uh, surprising that you'd get um, a, a similar sort of overall distribution for the percentage uh, of words. So let me turn back to the slides here really quick. And again, Jared, chime in if you don't see the slides. Um, over the last few years, there's been a paradigm shift in the field of natural language processing. So previously, researchers built models end to end on one data set. In truth, that's what we're doing today. But now researchers are starting from pre-trained language models. So they were trained on a large corpus of data, and then they take their data to this pre-trained model and fine tune those parameters to update the parameter values with their own data set. And these pre-trained models can be fit on hundreds of gigabytes of text data. They're these massive neural networks. And just a proxy for the popularity is we can see the number of stars in the hugging face uh, uh, Transformers Library, which is a repository for a lot of these pre-trained language models. And something I'm doing as part of my PhD is I've implemented a model that enables fine-tuning for pre-trained LDA models. Um, this is part of my PhD research. I won't get deep into the math here, but the gist is that you would use the weighted posterior of a pre-trained model as the prior uh, for fine-tuning on your own data set. 
And this is implemented in tidy LDA, and I'll give you a quick demo of that here. So moving back to uh, R, um, so we have this refit function uh, that looks a lot like the, uh, the arguments, a lot like the predict function. Uh, you hand it your model object that you want to start with, and then your new data and uh, some arguments to your Gibbs sampler as well. Uh, very similarly, you're going to get a progress bar, and we're going to print this out to the screen once it's done. Okay, so same information here. Uh, you can see it called refit now, so we know that this was fine-tuned, R-squared, most prevalent, most coherent topics. And so I can create a bar chart that's just like this one that you see here, but now we'll compare the prevalence of topics uh, from the model trained just on the first half of the book and uh, the model that was fine-tuned folding in information from the, the second half. Let me run that here. And so what we can see is that um, there's some significant changes in the overall prevalence of the topic. From So this is just predicting under the model where you can see this topic here was uh, very prevalent in the second half of the book. But once we folded in the topics, uh, that went down and uh, some of these other ones got a bit more mass. So basically these models drifted apart a little bit by fine tuning and folding in uh, that information from the second half of the book. Uh, and so for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, get into all of this, but you can uh, see which topics change the most linguistically. That's what this code does. And I'm going to make it as part of a vignette that I'm still working on for tidy LDA. Um, but here I can see that it looks like topic 17 had the, the highest linguistic changes. So if I just look at um, uh, the model summary from model one, um, typing that in here. So what was it? Topic 17 here. We can see those are the top five words in that topic. So if I want to uh, remember those words, uh, and let's let's compare um, to model two, um, and you can see that uh, that topic 17, those words have shifted appreciably from what they were in model one, Shepherdton boats lawn in way to it's that's there's bit weir, uh, and that should be a. Uh, uh, a pretty big change there. So, all right, so I will uh, go back to the slides here. Um, so I don't have code to, to show you this today, but that same um, fine tuning mechanism can be used to construct time series of topics uh, where you're updating the model based on new data as it's coming in each period. And so this graphic is from a model I built on grant abstracts in the Federal Small Business Innovation Research Grants Database. The bottom shows how the prevalence of this topic has changed over time from these funded grants. And the top shows how the distribution of words has changed within that topic over time. So data is the most prevalent word, and it uh, continues. It's one of my favorite words. I hope it's one of your favorite words. But you can see the, um, uh, the other top five terms have changed over time, where some words have dropped out and some new words have come in. And so one thing you can do with the refit function uh, that I didn't show you is that you can, uh, in addition to fine tuning the pre-trained topics, you can add additional randomly initialized topics on top of that pre-trained model. So if I have a model with 10 topics, uh, I can fine tune those 10 and add two randomly initialized topics uh, to try and discover new topics. This isn't a very pretty chart, but it does show some promise uh, uh, that adding these new random topics can be used for topic discovery. So when I built the SBIR model every year, I added two new topics. And in 2020, uh, the model picked up an emerging COVID-19 research grant topic. So uh, not rigorously researched yet, that, that's all ongoing, but um, uh, there is some promise there. So Tidy LDA is still under active development. Uh, I imagine the API will stabilize shortly after I finish my PhD. But in the meantime, I would love users and feedback, especially as trying as I'm trying to, to build some helper functions. So what common topic modeling tasks should be a single function call versus chaining together many operations uh, like I did in that demo? Um, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Um,
here are several different ways to get in contact with me, and uh, I appreciate your time today.